um, in the um, audience. Thank you very much. We'll convene this session then, which is an update on federal changes to the SNAP uh, Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Uh, I'll begin with introductions. Tony Carter, Ramsey County, District 4. I'm Nicole Bretham, Ramsey County Commissioner, District 1. Okay, Raphael. You can introduce yourself as you come in the door, <laughs> Commissioner Ortega. Uh -huh. We're introducing oh. around the table. Raphael Ortega, District 5. Victoria Rancher, District 7. To make them District 6. Tristan Mattis, Castillo, Commissioner, District 1. Tina Curry, Director of the Financial Assistance Services Department. And I'm Amy Anderson, Manager of NBA. Hi, Ryan O'Connor, County Manager. Mary Jo McGuire, County Commissioner, District 2. And we'll begin out here on the road to the left. Shannon Smith, Sergeant. Matt Hill, Commissioner Carter's office. Shannon Denny, Commissioner Carter's office. Uh, Melissa Jerhart, Commissioner Dwyer's office. Mary Sochi Grayala, Ramsey County Library's Board of Duties. Me, Chang Tal, Sam Tanny. Link Becker, Workforce Solutions. Lisa Lobs, Workforce Solutions. Zizia Lee, Chief Steward. Don Flores, President of Local 151. And we have someone coming in the door. Please introduce yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I appreciate this opportunity and ask the county manager if given the timing right now as we prepare to go out to the National Association of Counties, we might hear from our departments regarding uh, the changes in SNAP and how we anticipate they might impact us uh, and to be available for any questions that commissioners may have. This is an opportunity as we move out to the legislative session of the National Association of Parents to address these issues together with partners from throughout the United States. And so we appreciate this and um, I'll go to the county manager for an introduction. Thanks, Madam Chair. I'll keep it brief. Uh, shout out to Tina, her team, Paul, for being willing to help pull this together on a tight timeline. Um, the information wasn't able to make it even by the time we needed to go to print last week. And so we were able to get the agenda done and then basically hit publish. Um, and so since that time, we were able to pull the information together. But we had a couple of movements in our calendar that allowed us some time today, and that enabled this conversation to be able to take place. I would like us to come back and have a more robust conversation on some of the pieces around like worker requirements in April um, in alignment with some better understandings of how that impacts the county and, and what that's gonna mean across the org. What Tina was able to say though is some of the updates and information we already know about we could bring forward today. So it's a, it's a bit of a larger topic that'll be with us um, beyond just today. Good morning, Madam Chair and Commissioners. Um, Amy Anderson is the manager for our Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program. Our plan this morning is to provide an overview of the new federal SNAP rule, present the plan the Department of Human Services has developed in response to the rule, and then we'll wrap up with what the changes will mean for our residents and our staff. Beginning April 1st, every able-bodied adult without dependents, we typically call them ABODs, between the ages of 18 to 49 will have to work at least 20 hours per week in order to keep their SNAP benefits. Otherwise, those benefits will be capped at three months within a 36-month period. The disabled, senior citizens, pregnant women, and children under 18 years of age, age with their parents are exempt from this rule. Those who cannot find, find 20 hours of paid work per week have the option to participate in 20 hours per week in a job training program. The department regularly re refers individuals to the Ramsey County SNAP ENT program that is administered by Workforce Solutions. The work requirement has existed since 1996. It is not new. But many states, including Minnesota, requested and re were granted a waiver. Under the new rule, states can no longer ask the federal government to temporarily waive the work restrictions unless it's um, for a county with an unemployment rate of at least 10% or higher. Or if the state can prove a lack of sufficient jobs. 
we still do not know how they're defining sufficient jobs. Okay. States have been able to waive three-month benefit limit in areas where the unemployment rate was as low as 2.5%. I believe our unemployment rate is around 3% in Ramsey County. In Ramsey County, we have approximately 1,800 residents that will need to meet the new work training requirements. Otherwise, they will no longer be able to receive their SNAP benefits. This is roughly 3% of our SNAP population or 6% of our overall SNAP cases. Can I hear that one more time? That so was just a lot of numbers. Just, I'm trying 1800. to 1,800. 1,800. Okay. Impact, are in, impacted by this. By this. Okay, great. 1,800 ABI individuals. Mm -hmm. That's 3% of our overall SNAP population. Okay. Okay. And it's 6% of our SNAP cases. Okay. Commissioner Reinhardt. Okay, so if I'm understanding you correctly, then 1,800 are able-bodied. Um, they fall under the current um, requirement of the this work requirement, mm -hmm. but for whatever reason, they haven't had haven't been able to get a job. That's right. They have. They're not working 20 hours at least 20 hours. Okay. And I, I do have just one, and I know we're going to come back and have more discussion on this, but um, there's, there's obviously a reason, <coughs> and I'm wondering when we say able-bodied, are they really talking about physical, or are they talking about the uh, emotional, uh, mental capacity to be able to do the work? Because it's because you can sit at a desk doesn't mean you can do the work at the desk. <coughs> so, are things like, um, I suppose, addiction and things like that are, are not included here, but I mean, there's, there's got to be able-bodied. I, I yeah. guess I want to know what the definition of able-bodied is, mm -hmm. because there's, a, there's yeah. clearly a reason why they're not working. Yeah. Well, that's true. Commissioner Reinhardt, that's a very good question. I believe that if they are, if they have some mental or emotional issues, then they could be certified as disabled, and then this rule would not apply to them. But the key is that they would have to get that certification in place so that they would qualify as disabled. And can you be uh, temporarily disabled, and, and or does it have to be permanently disabled in order to be certified? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Commissioner Reinhardt, uh, one of the, uh, I'll just touch on um, one of your questions before. If you're participating in the CD program, you're also exempt from the work, work registration. So that is already an exemption. Um, clients can be chemical dependency. I'm sorry. Um, clients can um, be certified disabled um, from a physician statement, and the physician would, you know, they would be the ones that would tell us what the time frame would be the disability if they're not certified through Social Security Disability. So there's more than one way to get that certification. Okay. I'm sorry. I wonder if you wouldn't mind if I repeat your question slightly because it was coughing and didn't hear the response. I apologize. Um, Commissioner Reinhardt asked about why those 1,800 might not yet uh, or might not qualify for their SNAP benefits, and you were responding as to why. I heard the discussion about disabilities, but I wasn't sure if these are residents who haven't certified yet as disabled, this entire 1800, or if you were referencing some who might. Could you please just these, repeat that? These, um, Madam Chair, these 1800 have not certified as disabled. They have not? They have not. Okay, and I guess, just because we're on this line of questioning, I wanted to ask if there was a sense that they may, a portion of them or a majority of them, but not yet have moved through the process. Some of them may go down that path and apply for a disability. Right. Well, I guess that's all we know at this point. Because I, I don't know if I missed it or if I just didn't hear it. 
under disabled, is that mentally and physically disabled or is it just physically? Is it mentally it's or physically? Physical. Okay, so there's a mental disability that you would categorize as yes. So that does include yes. that. And you also indicated that chemical dependency. And chemical dependency. Okay. Thank you. Um, and Commissioner. Thank you. Commissioner Fretton. Um, how is it? How is the 20 hours calculated? And uh, I, I'm just thinking about the number of people with very inconsistent work schedules who might work 20 hours one week and not the next. And uh, what are the reporting requirements? And what happens if someone drops below that threshold but manages to get back up? What are what are those impacts? Sure. Um, so it's 20 hours a week or 80 hours a month. You can look at it. You know, so if they work 10 hours one week, then they would have to work 30 hours the following week. And you look at it. Retroactively, so the prior month um, okay. of application. Okay. And, and does this mean people could like come on and off month by month, depending on how many hours they work? Jeez. They would be exempt one month and then not be exempt the other month. Yes. And is that gonna? What is the typical reporting for people in this this category? Is this going to increase the workload for workers if, if people are going to be reporting more to try to keep their benefits? And I don't know if you'd rather handle that in line with the DHS proposal and impact of changes here or go directly to that. Okay. So we might touch on that a little okay. later on. The, is that the, a right the discussion? Yes, mm -hmm. that's fine. Okay, so we'll come back to the question. And I don't hear this. I just, I, I, when you talked about the fact that, you know, there are folks, the 1800 that can uh, be certified and may go that route, um, it just saddens me to think that um, the stigma that would be placed on someone for having to say that. Um, even if it's just, if, if it's not a permanent disability, um, but especially for uh, the emotional issues. I, I mean, it, it's like adding insult to injury. Thank you. Go ahead, Just to put this in context, so this was, was this, pardon my cynicism, this was not, was, how, how did this come about, this new policy, was, was it, did it, did they work with people that were affected by it or did, was this an attempt by the federal government? <laughs> I'll just answer my own question. To just save money, I mean, I'm guessing that they didn't really ask us what our opinion was and they, don't, they aren't really doing this <clears throat> to help. I mean, they just are doing this to save money um, and um, they're not really necessarily, didn't come from the community is what I mean. Uh, Madam I'm Chair. Probably, <laughs> Commissioner Carter, I can assure you did not come from yeah. the community of impacted individuals. Right. I mean, it stems back, as Tina mentioned earlier, it stems back to the 1992 work yeah. rule requirements that were a bipartisan establishment at the time. Um, and this removes the waivers that have been allowed in some mm -hmm. cases since then on a state-by-state -state level. So it's, it, it's in some ways not new, but it would be new to the state of Minnesota. And I'll just make one global comment as Tina keeps going, which is, there is scant, being kind, none, uh, research that shows additional requirements and conditions being put on the ways to help um, empower and lift up individuals, young people, and families uh, around the efficacy of that. And so the reasons you can define how you'd like, but I would just say from a service delivery side, we both need to answer your short-term questions about how to implement the program as effectively as possible to help as many people as we can, while also continuing to push on the broader question of the conditions that we are placing on people, um, which become barriers to long-term success. Thank you. Well said, Commissioner. Fretham. All right, Commissioner Fretham. Commissioner Fretham. Then you, you may have the may, may not have this data, but do you know, or is there a way to find out of those 1,800 how many of them may have criminal records that are making it challenging for them to find work, and how many may be um, children who have exited the foster care system? Thank you. Mm -hmm. We don't have that data. Okay. All right. Thank you for asking the question. We'll report in the future. Commissioner Reinhardt. Well, and I know this is just a policy statement, but I'm just um, really upset about <laughs> this. Um, and, and, and really, the whole point behind SNAP is, and, and the, the uh, safety net services yeah. that are provided, is to help people so that they don't fall into 
uh, having to rely solely on, on government to, to take care of them and their families. And so when you, re and this is like a punishment. Yes. Instead of trying to help people get on their own two feet and be able to provide the nutritious um, meals that people need and, and um, moving people up, it's really saying, well, you're not doing enough, and so I'm gonna beat you down further. I mean, this is punishment, as far as I'm concerned. Instead of trying to make things better, let's make them feel bad and worse, and oh, by the way, you don't get the food that you need. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right, we're back on track, and you know, I realize <laughs> that we probably won't spend an hour on this, but we do have lots of concerns at the table. I'm going to turn it over to Amy, who's going to update us now on the plan that the Department of Human Services has rolled out. Thank you. Okay. Um, so the two big changes are in regards to banked months and then work registration exemptions. Um, so <coughs> banked months is um, this population that we're talking about that can get the three months of eligibility in the 36-month period. Um, currently, they can get up to an additional six months of eligibility um, using banked months. Um, and those are just months of eligibility that have been allocated to the state. Um, we've historically had an abundance of these months, um, and the change is that we will no longer have an abundance of these months. Um, so, uh, because we're no longer allowed to roll them over from fiscal year to fiscal year. Um, so currently, there are 58,000 unused bank months in Minnesota. Um, so DHS has developed a plan um, starting April 1st through the end of September 30th to use as many of these bank months as possible because we won't be able to roll them over starting October 1st. Mm -hmm. um, another big change is the allocation of bank months will, will be changing. So on average, the state uses 6,000 banked months in any given month. And starting October 1st, we will have 12,000 banked months for the whole entire year. Mm -hmm. um, so we will have to be a little bit more strict on the requirements for using bank funds. We don't know what that looks like yet, but that's a change that we do know is coming. Um, a good commission. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Madam Chair. Uh, real quick <coughs> question on this. Mm -hmm. Like uh, 58,000 that they're going to get out the door and mm -hmm. then you know, the six or 12 that are there. Do they do that to counties or to programs based on formula or is it a need base by you, you make the claims when you allocate them? I mean, hopefully get those allocations, or is it a formula? And we would know how many of those 58,000 will come to Ramsey County folks. We know how many of the 6,000 or 12,000 we get. <coughs> it's not based on a formula. It, there hasn't been any need to um, allocate them any specific way because there's always been so many. Right. Um, so any any applicant that is applying and, and, and is an ABOD has gotten um, these banked months in, in all counties in the state. So, okay, so it's going to be need-based. I guess the only thing that, you know, comes to my mind then is they'll run out. I don't know. I mean, you, they could get, go out, those 58,000 can go out the door by July. Mm -hmm. They may not last to September. And, you know, for our Rams County folks, we want, want to make sure that anybody who's going to request a bonus eight months, we get out there early. Thank you. And I don't know how details you want to go into but we've already centralized those caseloads within FAS to it's a it's a manual monthly tracking for all 1800 of these cases um, to make sure that we are using as many as we possibly can for Ramsey County residents. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the other change is the expansion of um, work registration so DHS is also working on identifying potential ways to um, to expand current exemptions to more recipients, so that would be for these 1,800 individuals that we're speaking about. Um, some initial ideas include allowing more households to be exempt um, due to having a child in the home under the age 18. Um, right now, that exemption is only for the custodial parents, so looking at expanding that to non-custodial parents as well. Um, and then expanding who meets an exemption due to hardships obtaining employment, um, employment including the homeless population, victims of domestic violence and underemployed veterans. Um, they haven't released any specifics on, on what that will look like yet. And these are rules that DHS is empowered to set within our state? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
Go ahead. And where does like education fall in? Is that already an exemption? You know, if they're doing some training or whatever to get prepared, that's already an yeah. exemption that qualifies for these these laws. Yes, um, enrollment in higher education is, is already an exemption. Yeah. I mean, would it go to like potentially like some, some of the work that say like someone's doing with the partnership programs and that type of stuff too, or is it got to be an all accredited? Higher education program. But actually, most of these folks probably aren't ready to go to a more community based, you know, summit, you know, mm -hmm. type support where they're trying to get a job. Right. Yeah. Does that meet the threshold for education or not? Um, yeah, some of them do. There's like a seven page list of all of the programs that do um, meet the requirement, which we can. This begins to get at the question that Commissioner Frentham was asking originally. I know that we'll hear more as we go through. Uh, Commissioner McGuire, you have a So I maybe should wait on this also, but you just asked the question, Commissioner Carter, um, on whether DHS has the ability to do this. So did you say they do have the ability to make these exceptions, or they need to get permission from the federal government to make those exceptions? They would need to get permission. They need to get, I mean, they still need to propose, it's a proposed change. So that's what yeah, they hope they that support. they can get through. They would, uh, thank you. Yeah, thank they, you. they can't just do it on their own. They have to apply. They have to apply, they to, have to, they have to, they have to apply yeah. to get it and then get the federal approval. Wow. That's where NACO comes in, I hope. Thank you. Can all that's where we're on this. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you okay. for clarifying then, that. Yeah. Commissioner Mattis Castillo. Yeah, I mm -hmm. just, I wanted to go back. Uh, we heard earlier this year at an AMC conference about this stuff coming out and the waivers going away. And many uh, rural counties were saying, were panicking because their workforce department wouldn't have enough staff or capacity to fill the role of finding jobs, mm -hmm. especially in those rural Again. counties. Uh, I know Ling is here and not to put mm -hmm. her on the spot, but do we have <laughs> capacity? Uh, at, a, at our county to you know take on these uh, additional 1800 so that is the question we've quickly. been <laughs> delaying oh, wow. uh, yeah. and so we're going to let you go on and address okay. that we do we are very concerned with our capacity yeah. mm -hmm. and cost mm -hmm. as it relates to addressing this population and on that part this is part of the conversation we're gonna have later this spring so workforce is working with FAS right now to answer some of those questions more specifically as we get more understanding of what the rollout looks like and so that's part of what we're not ready to do robustly today right and, and I understand that this came up really quickly I just want us to have some solid initial talking points yeah. as we head out to DC next yes. week yeah, um, you know I mean if we have a good indication this is gonna put a significant strain mm -hmm. we I think we should have those talking points as we head to DC next week we don't need the exact numbers you know and and or if we're panicking for no reason to panic we should know that too. okay and so thank you that's yeah. where all the questions are to, headed to just okay. to highlight that uh, also to highlight like Commissioner Capetas Castillo said right any any chance we, we don't have to have exact numbers but just some number I mean just some indication for our policymakers so that they can get a handle on this and so we can talk to them they do like as many specifics or how this really impacts people's lives so any stories we can as you can best address as best you can questions. give us that best you can give us those talking points that we will take those mm -hmm. so <laughs> we realize that we're not prepared for that today right um, to the extent you can address those questions in short order as we're heading out to the National Association of Counties this weekend and if I could just add one other piece, Madam Chair. So we're trying to plan a date to have Congresswoman McCollum here. And yes. Which is, so I, what I would actually say is plan the date for her around the okay. time we can do in April so we can have that conversation yeah. more specifically. Okay. People are worried about being able to give you enough specificity by next yeah. week, to be frank. And so I'm okay. being a counterweight to that a little bit, right. not because I disagree with what you want. No, right. And I think we should stick to the talking point overall of just how, I mean, I'll go back to the broader <laughs> policy question like Commissioner Reinhardt's comments stand. but. At some level, if we get into the minutia, we lose the macro, which is right. ultimately what we're hoping that the, the board here would carry forward at NACO. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, and I and I appreciate that. And um, and we so appreciate your being willing to come forward with this information today. So we're going to let you go ahead and uh, complete your presentation. In terms of what the changes will mean for our for our residents that are impacted, it means our low income families 
are put in the position to have and to trade off between food and other basic necessities. Unfortunately, food is the first thing that usually goes. People will turn to their food shops, okay, to meet their food needs, which will create additional strain on charitable food networks that operate on limited resources. Overall, the effects of the new regulation will fall hardest on people of color because they have the highest unemployment rates. With the new rule, we would anticipate the number of ABI cases to dwindle down even further. Okay. Remember, we already have a relatively small number of cases, approximately 1,800. The challenge for workers is the manual working of those cases and the tracking of them. In terms of managing the current SNAP caseloads, we have three dedicated SNAP teams comprised of 35 workers. Current caseload sizes are high. They're between 700 and 800. But there are 14 workers in training. Eight workers are in phase two training. And we are incrementally building their caseloads. Six financial workers are in phase one training, and they will begin receiving cases um, next month. Okay. Commissioner so Goyer. Just, just as I'm reading this, <clears throat> so the case will go, won't taper off because it's helping. It's just that there, it will taper off because people aren't going into the program, right? right. So we just right. want to be clear that, that, that is this is what they this is what they hope will happen. Mm -hmm. That case will growth will taper off, but it's not for the re it's not because. These people are being no, helped. Right. It's because that's people right. aren't applying. So I think we just need to keep yes. that clear. That's great. And then um, I just need to restate what I said before: the federal government attempt to save money. It's really attempt to to transfer a responsibility. It's not really going to save anybody any money. It's going to it's transferring responsibility from them to us, so that we have to work on that or, or just away from them. So I'm I I, I, sh I misspoke when I said what, what I thought their attempt was to do here. It's really just to abdicate responsibility for this. And even yeah. as the caseloads may yeah. taper off, the needs will the still there. Still and, still and, increase, and then yeah. they, yeah. Right. And, yeah. and then what we worry right. about is that right. they begin to show up in yeah. those areas, which are most mm -hmm. difficult <coughs> and most costly right. to address. Right. Commissioner Reiner. Well, and I do think it's important to note um, that what did you say? It was 1,800 with 3% or 5% of the total? Mm -hmm. I mean, 3% of the population, of the SNAP population. Of the SNAP population. So the majority, by far, 97% uh, are meeting these requirements and, and what needs to happen. And so what that tells you is that this very small yeah. percentage, the individuals there are the ones that are probably most in need. Yes. Yeah. True. Commissioner, because they don't have other places to turn. Well, I don't want us to. <laughs> I mean, get so bad. Yeah. Make all right, this mess I, on this okay. transferring. There's, this is just a lack of humanity and caring right. for people <laughs> yeah. in this administration, and it's yeah. outright racism. Yeah. And it's got nothing to do with. They don't even care if the locals cover this or transfer. Oh or yeah, you're right. right. This is just a lack of caring for people. Yeah. It comes down to other places. And right. I'm just going to call it all. Right. You know, moving forward, though, okay. you talked about we need to get a better sense of, you know, kind of the work requirements and stuff. But, you know, I'm glad Elizabeth's here, but I mean, you know, the whole public charge thing is even going to be mm -hmm. probably a bigger concern for yes. us in all of our areas and having an understanding of how this fits here because this is very specific. Mm -hmm. But we're going to probably start seeing, I mean, yeah. there was an article in the paper today where, I mean, programs all over the country mm -hmm. are just like going to nobody showing up. There's nobody wants to be registered or yeah. get caught up in this public charge stuff. Right. So as we're taking a look at this more complex Absolutely. piece on this, the workforce stuff, right. I want to get a better sense of the impact exactly. the public charge is having throughout our organization because I mean, mm -hmm. we're asking for five, Homes for All is asking for $500 million. This public charge hits us like where they get it. It's not even I mean, all these mm -hmm. other areas. Yeah, that's right. mm -hmm. 
Yeah. And so we've just got to start getting a better sense of how we can help support people that either in this, you know, the able bodies or ABODs, how we can support them and help figure out and advocate them for the exemptions that are appropriate for them and actually make sense and how we can mm -hmm. help them. Mm -hmm. But then this bigger picture here of the public charge piece and all that's having an impact because people are just going to just quit showing up whether they're able bodies or not, whether they got families and kids or not. We were prepared to be able to bring this portion of the conversation today. Public charge clearly is the next piece that we do need to wrestle with. And I know that at this point in time, we simply weren't prepared to bring that forward today. But as you suggested, county manager, as we would bring our congressman here to discuss that with us, I assume that that would be a time when we would also be prepared with public charge and alternative. Yeah, Madam Chair, Commissioner McDonough, members. Um, I think the chair in last week kind of articulated a very similar point about the need to talk more holistically than just about one specific program. And that's the part where we said, I think April is the right timeline right now that we're working on to be able to do that. And so the public charge piece will be a part of that conversation. We'll go beyond federal work requirements. And we hadn't talked about the Congresswoman's visit aligning exactly with that, but there's an interest in having a visit from her. And just based on this discussion, I would strongly suggest we think about not having her like the week before we have that conversation. So um, we can work on that and, and think that through. Yeah, I think right. yeah. We've been, so yeah. we will. Thank you. The only thing I would say to this, I mean, Congressman McCall gets some stuff that's not like, yeah. Yeah. No. and there's not a lot she can do. About what are our responses here, right? And how, how we're thinking about how we're supporting people in our community is going to be the, the key here. It's not like, you know, bringing her more information that's going to actually make a change in this type of stuff. Mm -hmm. It's just not the environment for that to happen. And really well what is our response and april is our good. staff's request for the time they needed to give a good presentation to the board mm -hmm. it, the congressman mccollum thing just fits in well Seems with the to need align, to communicate more specific information yeah. that way and, yeah. and, and on that point absolutely we're fortunate that she gets it and all that but she does ask us for stories i mean that is what she asks us for she asks us for how she can help make that message out there so she she does want that from us so that's why we we need those 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 um that kind of information, but I, I agree she's with us, yeah, but and as much as we can Thank bring you. it to others too. Yes, I, I just want to add to your point because I think you're right. We need to think about what do we do. If this is happening, right? It's been in the works since 1992. This isn't just this administration. This was welfare reform under yeah. Bill Clinton, right? So let's remember. And now they just removed our waiver, so we have to be clear about that. Um, but thinking about, you know, for me, of course, this, the most impacted community is going to be Rondo Frogtown. We know the unemployment rate among 18 to 54 or 18 to 49 year olds is the highest in that neighborhood, mostly black men. Um, we have one food distribution that happens in Frogtown on Fridays that we give 20,000 pounds of food out in about an hour and a half to the community and people leave not receiving any food. Mm -hmm. So we have a tremendous need in our community to feed, and that's people who may or may not already have SNAP, right? So if we're thinking about what the needs are, we know where the biggest impact will be, we know what the need is, and oh, by the way, the food they're getting is not healthy, it's the leftovers that are taken off the shelves at, expression, at expiration date, right? And so thinking about what we can do holistically as a county to say, this is gonna happen, it's, we've been on this train, like how do we prepare for it and make sure we're feeding people and taking care of the need in the interim? So it goes to what Jim is saying and we, and we know where that is gonna happen and have the biggest impact. And so we will remain focused on the impact on people in our community and how we can address that in that. Thank you. Turn it back to the two of you. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So there's a full so, preparation. Oh. Let's be careful to wrap this up then. So Madam Chair, we'll come. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm good. Not that you know. Uh, Madam Chair, I'll, I'll we'll work on like a couple of talking points if we can to send off to NACO as a summary piece to it. I'll just ask Tina if you could connect with Ling and, and whatever we can share in terms of specificity and timelines that we don't know. It doesn't need to be super long, but a couple of bullets. I think the biggest piece is to know that this is on our radar and um, if we need to share updates in email format, we'll do that between now and April. We'll come back with a more comprehensive piece. And, and there's just this acknowledgement too of um, the way in which the administration has pursued 
this and similar policies is through not sharing full details to make it confusing as a part, I mean, that seems to be a part of the strategy at this point. And um, so we'll do the best we can in an uncertain environment. And we, we just need the help of uh, the board to continue to elevate that the idea is and not fall into a trap of looking at the short term implementation okay. as being the only need here because long term the whole system breaks for all the reasons you've cited right. regardless of our implementation mm -hmm. and a credit to all our staff for working through this those mm -hmm. whom are here today showing up I mean this is a strain on them and yep. they see the impacts every day to people coming in our doors that are feeling the stress mm -hmm. and uh, I wish I could offer a better answer than we need to shoulder on in the short term, but we got to continue to push for more. Thank you. Commissioner Reinhardt and then others, I'll check in with Commissioner Ortega before we're done. I believe it, it wasn't 1982, it was 1986, correct? That is correct. Okay. 1996. Um, and not that there's a whole lot, but just making sure that we've got the right uh, folks associated with it. But the fact of the matter is, since then, and SNAP has been under attack yeah, all exactly. the time. And I think that sometimes it's, it, it, you know, people try to isolate different things, say, oh, well, we got we got to make people do this to do that. And again, I think, Jim, you called it up yeah. for what it is, it's racism. Um, but it's also part of that, it goes beyond just the food on the table. Um, I mean, it's hard to get a job if you're hungry. <laughs> it's hard to uh, have housing and, and your family to take care of your family. And it comes down to your your value as a human being. And if you don't feel valued, what's going to happen? You're not going to be able to find something to do or have a job. So it's it's part of the big picture. And by by picking at pieces of it, that makes it easier for those that want to destroy it. So. Um, yeah, it's about human dignity, and that's really what it comes down to. And this is one part of it. Just, just to highlight what I already said, but I just, just this last point, C about caseload starting to taper off. Just be careful whenever you, it would be better to not say this. They're going to pick this up. Any, lots of people are going to pick this up, and it has to be followed by people aren't going to be applying for these programs because this is what they, this is what they want to show success in a program by that. So I just worry about statements like this that people will get. So just be careful how we talk about the caseload tapering off. I mean, it's just that people aren't applying. So we have to just not give them, not give them reasons to say this is going successful. Hungry. Yeah, exactly. I mean, there's got to be different ways, right? People, people are gonna don't go apply home. because they don't get help. Right, right. Commissioner, have we addressed your questions to the extent possible today? I just want to check back in. To the extent possible today, yes. And we will continue. So many more. Thank you. Mr. Ortega? Well, we've been through this for <laughs> so many times. Uh, I think we just wait till we get all the facts so we can make a good decision on how we move forward. Thank you. So we appreciate Jim, what you brought before. Oh, Commissioner, I'm sorry. Um, I did just want to comment because, you know, like Tina, you're here a lot, but Amy, I don't know that you've ever been here before, and the staff that <laughs> showed up here today. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the important piece of this is really helping drive some confidence with the board that staff are on this. Yes. If you're thinking about this, you really understand the impact. I don't know that there's any new revelation in this engagement, it's, but it's important, I think, for staff to have the opportunity to come here so i really appreciate that you you know put this on the agenda to be able to have this but then also provide us with some confidence that, you know our staff are within our mission every day and trying to work on this when we have external forces are affecting us every single day and we're trying to meet the needs of our residents so thank you thank you and once again i would just reiterate that we really appreciate that although others may not here be attuned to our mission and vision for a health and wellness opportunity investment within our community that our staff is. And we thank you for presenting us with your knowledge of the DHS role and uh, proposals moving forward, but also your understanding of who will be impacted within our community and planning and work to address those impacts. We look forward to talking with you again likely in the April time frame after we've come back also with whatever information we might learn from the April conference um, and are able to specifically address our local concerns.
Are there any other comments? Thank you. And we have a